teenage terror. Told for the first time on TV by a young mom caught up in a tormenting, <laughs> wicked attraction. The small Texas city of Palestine lies midway between Houston and Dallas. Full of old town charm and values, it's a place where strangers are made to feel at home. But what happened here in January 2000 was so shocking, cruel, and unnecessary that the memories still haunt the community. January 26, 2000. It's 11 p.m. Palestine police are making a welfare check on 84-year-old widow Geraldine Davidson. The retired schoolteacher and church organist known as Jerry lives alone. When she misses choir practice, her friends begin to worry. We look through the doors and the windows to see if we can see anybody. Especially with her being an elderly individual, we looked in to see if we could make sure she wasn't sick or injured and falling down. 425. Jerry's three children haven't heard from her either. I just kind of thought, well, maybe she went up to Tyler to do shopping or something like that. Because she did that a lot. We lived two hours away, and she was there all alone. And I just worried about her falling and no one knowing and not being able to get help. The safety of a mom was on everybody's mind. Miss Davidson. The back door is unlocked. Miss Davidson. I uh, didn't hear anybody, didn't see anybody. The house was actually really clean and looked to be in really good condition inside. Seeing no sign of anything wrong, Officer Munez decides not to venture inside. He thought that she had driven away from home, gotten lost, and that she would return back uh, later in the evening. Officers on patrol are asked to keep a lookout for her gray Buick. Minutes after leaving the house, Officer Munez spots what looks like her car. I could tell that it was a Buick, so I decided that uh, I would turn around and uh, see if it was her going home and make sure she was okay. 160 radium. Go ahead and place this out with that suspicious vehicle. I'll give you the location in just a moment. Driver, put your hands on the wheel. You have a driver's license? No. All right. You have a registration for this car? No. Who's the vehicle belong to? Nobody knew who the car actually belonged to. They couldn't give me the name of the registered owner. What are you guys doing out here? Sergeant Munez soon confirms his fears. That it was definitely Miss Davidson's car. The license plate comes back. It's registered to Miss Davidson. That caused quite, quite a bit of concern because now not only is she unaccounted for, she's no longer in her vehicle, and the chances of her being just lost or confused are probably pretty low. All right, what I want you to do is go ahead and open the door, step out of the car, and I want you to face forward. The five people in the car are taken downtown for questioning and the vehicle towed for processing. Officers return to Jerry's home, now more concerned than ever. This time, they discover a kitchen window has been broken from the outside. Drawers are open and have been rummaged through. Upstairs, they find further evidence the house has been ransacked. The district attorney's office is called in. It's not a murder investigation, but I promise you that bells were going off. There are people in her car. There are things in the car that look very suspicious. Something's bad has happened to Miss Geraldine Davidson. Officers interview the five young people found in Jerry's car. They claim they rented the vehicle from someone else. 
in exchange for drugs. People use crack cocaine, rocks of crack cocaine as currency. If they don't have money, they swap it for what they call a rent car, and that's what they call it. Investigators get their first major break, a name. Those arrested say the car was rented from Danielle Simpson, a street thug well known to the authorities. He's been dealt with in the past for a violent crime as well as some other offenses. On one occasion, an argument with a girlfriend almost proved deadly. Listen to yourself. The woman eventually decides not to press charges. He uses anger or a violent behavior uh, in an instrumental fashion that it's a, a tool at his command. I think he had many psychopathic traits. Other people's pain doesn't uh, slow him down or deter his behavior. Two hours after finding Jerry's home ransacked, Officers arrive at Danielle Simpson's last known address. Now, Ms. Simpson, what can I do for you? Okay, I'm here uh, looking for somebody. You know a person named Danielle? It's Danielle there. Simpson manages to flee after a chase through the streets. Despite the loss of her husband 15 years earlier, Jerry Davidson's enjoying her retirement. She'd been a much-loved history and music teacher at a local high school. She really loved this old home. She was not going to move under any circumstances. This was her home. And this is where her friends were. However, her sons and daughter have grown increasingly concerned about her living alone. Recently, Jerry found a window broken. And then two strangers arrived. Hi. How's it Hi. going? Hey, we're from right down the street. We were wondering if we could come in and use your phone for a second. Uh, our mother's very ill. I guess that should be all right. Come on in. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. After she did let him in, then she did go upstairs. What are you doing in here? You get out of here! Get out of my house right now! She chased him down the stairs and out of the house. And she was joking about that. She was seemed to be proud of the fact that she was able to chase him out of her house. Two days into the investigation, Danielle Simpson's wife is brought in for questioning. This is the first time she's told her shocking story on camera. It's a tale of twisted love and a terrifying crime many people witnessed but chose not to report. As she begins to reveal what happened to Jerry Davidson. Police in Palestine, Texas, searching for missing church organist Jerry Davidson learned that hours before officers found her home had been ransacked, she missed a scheduled appointment, Alice Brewer's son's piano lesson. We went up and knocked on the door, and no answer. Something was wrong, definitely, yes, because she has never done that before. Chief suspect Danielle Simpson runs off when officers try to apprehend him. They want to know how he came to be driving Jerry's car and why he had rented it to some local teens. Now, his 16-year-old wife is brought in for questioning. Born Jennifer Smith, she reveals how her romance began with the neighborhood troublemaker. It was nice, it was sweet, we partied a little bit. I liked the way he treated him. School quickly takes second place as she becomes infatuated with Simpson. Well, around the ninth grade, I stopped being interested because I just wanted to spend time with Danielle. I didn't want to do anything else. I just wanted to be around him. 
Uh, he was still going to school, but he only went when he wanted to. The love affair doesn't go down well with Smith's mother and stepfather, who recognize Simpson as bad news. She won't let anyone keep them apart. So, you look good. Thank you. You got everything? Yeah. Ready? Well, I ended up running away with Danielle. We would go to motel rooms. We would stay for, like, weeks. And he wanted a baby. Simpson gets his wish. His girlfriend has a baby boy. Me having that baby was something that I had that I felt like was my own, something that really cared about me. So I was very happy about that. <laughs> to finance their romantic adventures, she steals money from home and gets turned in by her own mother. Hi, I'm bringing my daughter in. Which also brings big trouble for Simpson. They end up locking me up, and in the process, they lock Danielle up for messing with me, for messing with Amana. Still in love with Simpson, Smith learns there is a way she can get the charges dropped against him, and they can once more be together. Well, the only way I can get him out is if I married him. So. I got in contact with a lawyer, and we got married, and that's how that happened. I didn't want him to be locked up. They decided to get married in the theory that, well, if I'm married to him, he's not going to be prosecuted for the sexual assault. It works. Charges are dropped, and Smith is now happy to become Mrs. Jennifer Simpson. But wedded bliss does not last long. I just need you to watch the baby. Yo, man, I ain't watching the baby, so man. Sorry. A new Danielle Simpson emerges, one with a violent temper. After I kept him out of jail and married him, that's when he really started showing me what it was. Most of the time he was high or just angry because he didn't want me to be around nobody. Sometimes there wouldn't even be a reason. It'd just be because he'd just go off and jump on me or whatever. But yeah, he was violent. I will kill you and your family. Get him! Danielle Simpson's violence escalates out of control. Even his own father becomes a target. Him and his dad got into it, so he been busted out all the windows in his dad's van. Stay here, man. Wait for me. Where you going? Come back here. At that point, I had already knew he had an anger problem, so when he gets like that, I just back away. Danielle chose his victims uh, in part on their based on their vulnerability. I think predator is, is an apt label. Uh, it describes a, a relationship between an individual uh, that sees other folks not as similar to him or herself, but rather as a, a, a resource, something to be utilized uh, without regard for their well-being or feeling, uh, much the way that a, a wolf views a lamb, if you will. Jennifer Simpson tells investigators on the morning of the day Miss Davidson disappeared, she heard her husband plotting to break into her home with a 13-year-old friend. Go ahead and rob this old lady. I heard him in the uh, kitchen talking about robbing a lady. And I was telling him to stop being so greedy about what he was doing. Danielle Simpson admits to her that he and another teen from the neighborhood had stolen from Miss Davidson's home just a week earlier. But he never told me what he got from her or nothing like that. And... He ended up walking out the house. Well, when he walked out, I walked out behind him. He had knowledge that Mrs. Davidson was an elderly female living alone and was vulnerable. Investigators now see Simpson's young wife in a whole new light. She admits once they knew Miss Davidson wasn't home, they smashed a window so she could go through. And I climbed in. I opened the back door. We all started looking around the house. Ten minutes later, there's panic. Cherry Davidson unexpectedly returns. And so we went to go hide. Can y'all come in here? We was going to go out the front door, but Danielle was like, no. I can hear her on the phone, and then the next thing you know... Don't answer that. Don't answer that. And Danielle was just telling her to shut up or whatever, and uh, hey, he ended up calling me and call her real quick. No. But she looked at me and she was like, "It's a girl." Stop. Yeah. 
And she was kind of scared, you know, I could tell her now she was kind of scared. The thieves aren't prepared to tie anyone up, so they grab the only thing they can find, some thin tape. You're annoying! Miss that tight, man, I don't want to hear her at all. I ended up putting it on her mouth, but she was fixing to try to scream or whatever, and I was just telling her, please, shh. Jerry's harrowing ordeal gets worse when Simpson returns with a pillowcase. Hold her, y'all. <laughs> Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Outside her home, Jerry Davidson realizes this might be her last chance to get away. Please let me go, please. Just help me. But will anybody see what's going on or hear her desperate cries for help? In January 2000, Jennifer Simpson is describing to investigators in Palestine, Texas, how she her husband, Danielle, and a 13-year-old boy broke into the home of frail Jerry Davidson and abducted her. With only flimsy packing tape over her mouth, she desperately tries to raise the alarm. So he started screaming at me, saying, why did I put the tape on her mouth or whatever, whatever. So he was arguing with me and stuff. They ended up putting her in the trunk. That's when I knew it was serious. They go buy some marijuana, they smoke what's called a blunt, which is marijuana that's laced in formaldehyde. It, it, it accelerates the, the high, makes people act crazy. Jerry Davidson is doing all she can to get free from the trunk, while her abductors bring her to a relative's home. Yeah, man, that's some crazy stuff. Danielle Simpson is seeking advice on where he might sell the stolen car. You have a lady in your car? It's not my car, it's hers. Hey, she wants to see her. And she was telling him about some chop shop stuff that they had going on. Simpson brags about what he's done. <laughs> Terrified prisoner. <laughs> Danielle opened the trunk of the car. Please, please, you can have my car. I can hear her talking and she was saying, telling him that he can have her money, he can have a car. All she wanted was her medicine or whatever. I'll, I'll just walk home. Shut up, man. Do you even know where you are? She was desperate. She knew she needed her be medicine. She was begging for it. Astonishingly, his aunt doesn't report what she's seen to the police. And his wife remains content to let Jerry's suffering continue. So I just wanted it to just go away, but I didn't say nothing. Didn't say anything. The 13-year-old accomplice is now high on the drugs they've all been smoking and ambivalent to what's going on around him. They pick up Simpson's 15-year-old brother, Lionel. Yo, come on, let's roll. Let's go, let's go. You do it? Yeah, I did it. She's in the trunk. He, too, is well known to local juvenile authorities for his violent reputation including once being accused of attempting to murder his own father. He ended up hitting his dad in the head with a bat. He's heard about their hostage and wants to show his older brother he's a tough guy, too. A lot of times they was in competition, like who was the baddest or who could do this first or who would beat who. The baddest or something like that. Jerry's abductors drive around Palestine, stopping again and again to display Jerry Davidson as a sick trophy. Let me out of here. Please talk to him. They open the trunk and show Mrs. Davidson off to these other individuals. None of them called in. None of them reported it. Try to understand why they would show her and allow her to be taunted and, and mistreated. Talks about uh, kind of a culture of anger almost that existed. These youth were involved in a, kind of a street gang culture, and the folks that they were stopping and showing Miss Davidson to were part of that same culture. I think it was kind of a status matter uh, being willing and able to do something this hard and, and cold uh, raised them in the eyes of their of their peers to some extent. What kind of place do we live in? What kind of people 
do we have in, in a community that they're so callous that they just they won't help somebody while they are showing her her off to their friends Lionel takes his fist and hits her and may have even taken the shovel and hit her Based on fingerprints found on the back of her car, prosecutors believe as many as 10 people viewed Jerry. That tells us that people were touching and leaning on the edge of the vehicle or the trunk, looking in at Mrs. Davidson. The gang then drives to a fast food restaurant, which is caught on surveillance tape. They sent me in there. Jennifer Simpson waits patiently in line, standing right next to an elderly woman. <laughs> and about to spend some of the money they've stolen from Mrs. Davidson. She has plenty of opportunity to raise the alarm, but is only interested in getting food. Simpson spends a full 20 minutes inside while their hostage languishes in the trunk just yards away in the parking lot. Tired of waiting, her brother-in-law, Lionel Simpson, goes in to get her. Lionel was saying that she was making noise in the trunk, so it was time for us to go. We need to get rid of her. Knowing they can't just Nobody let Jerry go, the group starts discussing what to do next. Lionel was talking about throwing her in a river and taping her up. <laughs> they stop at a store to buy duct tape before the heartless gang goes in search of somewhere quiet to inflict yet more suffering. So we drive to a dead end street, and Lionel and Danielle gets out first. Lionel Simpson enjoys brutalizing their frail hostage. And he's rough handling her, like kind of throwing her around. And Danielle's telling him to stop, but Lionel's not trying to hear what's going on. So Lionel starts taping, putting duct tape around her mouth. Quiet, quiet, quiet. So he turns her over and he puts her hands behind her back and he starts duct taping her arms together. She was laying on the ground. She was on the ground. And uh, Lionel picks her up again. And they put in a trunk. The gang goes in search of a concrete block. So Danielle drives around to this old house that they used to stay in. Lionel gets out. And I hear a sound like he hits her. Ah, shut up. So when he gets in the car, Danielle asked him, did you hit her? And he was like, yeah, I hit her. Let's go, man. Come on, let's go. Come on, man. Tripping, man. Let's just go. And I remember I was just thinking I just wanted it to be over with. Heading northeast, they arrive at a dirt road leading to the banks of the Natchez River. You can only imagine that she's scared. She's, I'm sure she's praying to the Lord to say, please save me, please save me. Jerry's ordeal reaches its seventh hour. I'm turned around looking at the back of the, uh, on the back of the vehicle. And I see Danielle and Lionel doing something. Only thing I saw was Lionel and Danielle arms. I couldn't believe that they did that. At that point, I don't even think I still even thought it would be a murder. I don't know what 
I thought they was gonna do to her. But once it actually happened, I just... And then the next thing you know, we all jumped in the car. And Dunya pulled off and left. The gang heads back to Palestine, dropping Jennifer Simpson and the 13-year-old boy off at their homes, where she goes to bed without raising the alarm. She falls asleep, but not for long, as her husband comes knocking, worried the police are on to him. He was like, man, I don't know what to do. And he ended up climbing in the bed with me. And we laid there for a minute. It didn't seem like even 30 minutes. The next thing you know, we heard, police is outside, the police is outside. So Danielle jumps up, and when he moves, the police is shining a light in the window. So Danielle ends up getting up, and he runs out the window. And they don't catch him. I go outside. And I'm looking around at what's going on. There's a whole bunch of cops outside. As the sun rises, police get word from a passing motorist that there might be a body in the shallows of the Natchez River. I see fresh tire tracks over here. And then right there in the water, we can see the red thing the caller called in about. She's got duct tape around her mouth and face. Her hands are, are pulled behind her back and bound, and her feet are bound together with uh, some type of rope that's tied to a cinder block that's weighing her down. An officer at the scene recognizes Jerry as the woman who taught him in fifth grade. This was a person that posed no harm, no threat, and, and no danger to anyone. This was such a violent and unnecessary death that it did have an impact on me. Her body is sent to the medical examiner in Dallas. The coroner confirms Jennifer Simpson's account of the savagery that had been inflicted on the frail grandmother. She had numerous injuries to her face, head, and torso. When the end finally came, it had been terrifying. The autopsy indicates that she was alive at the time she was placed in the water. She was thrown in the river and knew that she was going to die in this cold, lonely place. <laughs> Jerry Davidson had been bound with duct tape, tied to a heavy concrete block, and tossed into the freezing river where she slowly drowned. The cruelty of what she endured traumatizes her family. There's a lot of clinging and crying and wondering what do we do next and how do we how do we deal with this loss the small tight-knit community of palestine is equally horrified as details emerge of the torment and pain inflicted there's also fear danielle and lionel simpson and the 13 year old boy are still on the loose a fresh lead comes in well, we got information. Danielle Simpson is in a dope house over on South Jackson. We're going to meet up with a couple of the guys from the police department, uh, set up a little plan, make a run on it. Danielle's 15-year-old brother, Lionel, may also be hiding out at the fortified drug den. Danielle Simpson, once more, tries to escape. Please! I confronted him with my 45. He was taken into custody then. Lionel Simpson is also cuffed and taken away. The 13-year-old boy involved is apprehended at his home and brought to the city's juvenile lockup. Daniel Simpson refuses to cooperate with investigators. He asks for an attorney and won't say anything else. Danielle's attitude was defiant non-cooperative he didn't give us 
uh, any assistance uh, or any information that would further the investigation. His only brief admission is that he rode in the Buick for a short time. His brother, on the other hand, agrees to give a written statement to investigators. The magnitude of this offense, what they did, the seriousness, it didn't seem to have an effect on him one way or the other. According to Lionel Simpson, his brother came to him two weeks before the crime. Danielle had a plan to break into Mrs. Davidson's home and uh, steal whatever they could, and then to steal her vehicle and hopefully sell it uh, out of town somewhere to a chop shop and make what money they could. Lionel admits to investigators he was involved in the murder, but he says he had nothing to do with putting Mrs. Davidson in the river. He did it, no, she did it, he did it. It's just everybody finger pointing in different directions. Nobody really wants to take responsibility of who actually put Miss Davidson in the river. They each say the other one did it. Investigators can prove the Simpson brothers were the only two opening the trunk as they left incriminating fingerprints. They were there and either opened the trunk or closed it. Investigators now have enough evidence and information to bring murder charges. It became apparent that all four parties if you move it all, I will kill you. were involved in the, in the death of Geraldine Davidson. Each of them was subsequently charged also with capital murder. Psychiatrist Dr. David Self is asked by the state to evaluate Danielle Simpson. He appeared uh, uh, almost childlike at times. Where the facts that emerged about this offense clearly indicated that he was quite capable of extraordinary cruelty and, and heinous behavior. Dr. Self diagnoses him as a psychopath. He was clearly without conscience, without the, the capacity for remorse and guilt, uh, without the ability to empathically understand the, the feelings and, and sufferings of others. <laughs> and uh, failed to take responsibility for his own behavior uh, pretty characteristically. The following month, an Anderson County grand jury indicts Danielle, Lionel, and Jennifer Simpson, along with a 13-year-old boy, for capital murder. Now, wife turns on her husband as Danielle Simpson faces his own battle for survival. The state wants to execute him. But prosecutors receive a major setback. A judge rules that not a single word of one of the key confessions can be used in court. A ruling that might just let the killers get away with murder. In Texas, the city of Palestine's most shocking and disturbing trials are about to begin. A young husband and wife and two teens are accused of brutally assaulting, kidnapping, and murdering 84-year-old Jerry Davidson. We're going to tell the story just as if we were telling the story from that day of how she was brutally kidnapped and then finally murdered and dumped uh, in the Natchez River. Go ahead and rob this whole lady. I'm talking like clean her for everything. She's got man, everything. In a plea deal, the 13-year-old boy agrees to testify against the others. We've struck a deal because I feel that he's the least culpable in this case. He pleads guilty as a juvenile to murder and receives a sentence that matches his age, 13 years. Jennifer and Lionel Simpson will be tried as adults, but since they were under 21 at the time of the murder, the death penalty is off the table. In a letter to his mother, Danielle Simpson accuses his wife of being the main instigator 
and even suggests she threw Jerry in the river while he sat in the car. Oh, this is going on, man. When he was saying that I put the lady in the river, that I drove the car, and I couldn't understand why he did that. It defies logic, because who was driving the train all day long? It was Danielle and then Lionel. The whole community is angry and distressed by the murder, and so the court hearings are moved to neighboring counties. Just as Jennifer Simpson's trial is ending, she accepts a deal, life with the possibility of parole after 30 years. As long as she testifies against her husband and his brother. In our exclusive interview, she claims her conscience is bothering her. Because I always think, what would have happened if I did speak up? If I wouldn't have been so weak-minded, could I have saved her? Or could I have pre prevented it from happening? At the start of Lionel Simpson's trial, prosecutors receive a blow. They can't use his statement against him because of a major error which the defense seized on. The law is pretty clear. It says you've got to contact his parents. Well, we didn't do that. In the end, the case is still strong enough, and he too is convicted, getting life with the possibility of parole after 40 years. Psychiatrist Dr. David Self, who evaluated Danielle Simpson for the state, tells the jury he has a dangerous personality disorder. We undertake what's called risk assessment. I assess Danielle at that time as being in a high-risk group. I think that the uh, events of driving her around and tormenting and torturing and uh, mistreating her were amongst the crueler things I'd ever heard of in my whole life. After a five-day trial, Danielle Simpson learns he must die for what he did. 11 months after the commission of this offense, Danielle Simpson is found guilty of capital murder and sentenced to die by lethal injection. It's mind-boggling to think that people could act that way toward another human being, you could allow another human being to be treated in such a way. In November 2010, a decade after the vicious murder of Jerry Davidson, Danielle Simpson makes his final walk to the execution chamber. Paul Stone is there to cover the story. You enter a room, uh, as they open the door, you're looking in a glass, and the condemned killer is on the gurney, strapped in. In many cases, capital murder defendants will make some type of apology to the victim's family and to the victim. Uh, Mr. Simpson made no such statement. I'm gonna miss y'all. I'm ready. I'm ready. And nine minutes after the administration of those drugs, Mr. Simpson was pronounced dead. It didn't make me feel any better. I still remember my mother. I still know she was brutally murdered, slowly tortured and brutally murdered. But her assailant is now gone. Jerry Davidson's family still finds it hard to believe that no one who saw her in the trunk that day raised the alarm. People watched this and did nothing. And they're as guilty as any of those others that actually went to jail and the death penalty for it. Somebody could have and should have stopped that while it was going on. In 2007, the youngest boy involved reaches his 21st birthday. He's released on parole for seven years, due in part to the forgiving nature of Jerry Davidson's family. We could see some redemption, some good to come out of this young man's life. We just felt it was the, uh, the right thing to do. 
Jennifer Simpson will be eligible for parole in 2030. She will be 47. If I can go back and change the hands of time, would it be something to prevent what happened? Because what happened to her was wrong, and I'm sorry. A new law is introduced in Texas in the memory of Geraldine Davidson. To witness a felony crime and not report it is now a criminal offense. Occasionally you run on to some behaviors that are just frankly very difficult to understand what would motivate somebody to behave in that fashion. And this was one of those cases. Yo, come on, let's roll, let's go, let's go. When Lionel joined Danielle that infamous day, it became a wicked attraction with deadly intent.